George Brown College uh, and uh, the uh, Metropolitan University of Toronto, formerly Ryerson Center for Studies in Food Security. We are uh, had our we started our first webinar series last year, uh, and we learned a lot about Brazil. Um, and then we had a series we had a set really interesting session on Scotland, Denmark, Italy, most recently Germany. Um, and uh, we're looking forward to a session on Japan and France very soon. Um, and this comes in the context of Canada. Uh, really uh, poised to launch uh, its own harmonized cost-shared universal healthy school food program in partnership with provinces and territories and cities and communities. And then learning from around the world is very important in this process. Um, some of you might know that there's a new coalition called the uh, School Meal Coalition hosted by the World Food Program. And Dr. Donald Bundy, who is uh, organizing a fabulous consortium of academics around the world, and Amberly represents Canada on that uh, uh, consortium, has uh, spoken about how interesting it is, not just for Canada, but for the world to be organizing a program uh, with a federal set of criteria um, that will, uh, that has started not in the 50s or uh, 150 years ago, but in the context of the current situation with all that faces our children uh, with the fast food crisis and uh, the potential for what school food programs can do for multi benefits for families, for women, for children, for health, for well being, for the economy, for education. So it's both an exciting moment. We had hoped to hear the good news that there was money in budget. 2022, which happened a few weeks ago. Instead, we got a commitment, which is good. And the words are over the next year, the Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food and the Minister of Families, Children and Social Development will work with provinces, territories, municipalities, indigenous partners and stakeholders to develop a national school food policy to explore how more Canadian children can receive nutritious school food. Uh, nutritious food at school. So this is great. We have uh, uh, commitments. We also had the first ever inclusion in two mandate letters. This had never happened before. This was only as recently as December um, 2021. So the Minister of Agriculture to work with the Minister of Social Development on the creation of the program and our coalition and our 195 members and uh, 80 endorsers and our academic partners at the, Can the Canadian Association of Food Studies, School Food Working Group are all busy trying to say, okay, if you were going to design the best school food program in the world, what would it look like? And it's in that context that it's a great delight uh, to have a webinar on the United States, of course, one of the largest uh, school food programs of the G7 countries. And um, I'd love to introduce uh, Dr. Amberly Roots, who is going to um, chair and facilitate this session. Um, many of you know Amberly from the important research she and Dr. Mary McKenna have done on what is going on in Canada right now. Uh, and Amberly is also a former practitioner at a school uh, in a student nutrition program in southwestern Ontario and uh, is doing a postdoc at the University of Saskatchewan. So Amberly, I'll pass it over to you. Great, thanks so much, Debbie, for that introduction. Um, and I wanted to start by saying it was my great pleasure uh, to plan this webinar and to invite our three esteemed guests today to this panel. Um, but before I introduce them, I would like to share a few housekeeping details. The duration of the webinar today is 90 minutes, and we will start with a one hour um, session of presentations from our three panelists. And then this will be followed by a 30 minute question and answer period. We encourage you to submit questions um, today through the chat function, and we'll be answering um, and directing them to our panelists at the end of the session. Um, so today, without any further ado, I will now introduce our three panelists. First, we will hear from Marissa Chung, who will give an overview of some of the child nutrition programs supported by the United States Department of Agriculture. Marissa currently serves as the USDA's Food and Nutrition Services Acting Deputy Associate, Associate Administrator for Child Nutrition Programs. With over 20 years of experience in, a, in federal food assistance programs, Ms. Chung has held a variety of positions in support of advancing food security and nutrition among low-income communities. 
In her permanent food nutrition services role, she serves as the director of special nutrition programs in the Western Regional Office based out of San Francisco, California. Ms. Chung received her Bachelor's of Science in Nutritional Sciences and Clinical Dietetics and her Master's of Public Health from the University of California, Berkeley. Next, we will hear from Lacey Stevens to learn more about farm to school programs in the USA. Lacey is the program manager for the US National Farm to School Network, where she works to expand the farm to school and farm to early care and education movement. Based in Montana, Lacey is also a registered dietitian with a master's degree in sustainable food systems. Lacey has led or coordinated notable national research projects, including the 2015 and 2018 National Farm to Early Care and Education Surveys and a Farm to School Economic Benchmarking Study. Lacey coordinates the National Farm to School Network Farm to Early Care and Education Working Group and the Farm to School Research Committee as well as serves on the Child and Adult Care Food Program National Advisory Council. And lastly, is the president of the Montana Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Last but certainly not least, we will hear from Janet Poppendick. Janet is a professor emerita of sociology at Hunter College, City University of New York, and author of several books, including Free for All, Fixing School Food in America. Janet is also a co-founder of the New York City Food Policy Center at Hunter College and a senior fellow at the Urban Food Policy Institute at the Cunney School of Public Health and Public Policy, Health Policy. Janet also serves on the board of directors of Community Food Advocates and the advisory committees of Wellness in Schools and the Urban School Food Alliance and the Hunter College Welfare Rights Initiative. Her primary concerns, both as a scholar and as an activist, our poverty, hunger, and food assistance in the United States. Without any further ado, I will turn it over to Marissa to kick off the webinar today. Thanks so much to you all for joining us. Well, thank you, Amberly, for the introduction um, and certainly to the coalition for the invitation to the United States Department of Agriculture to join today's distinguished panelists. Um, I'm excited to be here to share a little bit about our school meal programs in the US and then also to learn more about your efforts in Canada. Um, so if we could queue up the slides. Thank you. Next slide, please. So just to set the stage very broadly, um, there are four principles that guide our federal child nutrition programs. First, they help sustain domestic agriculture as the U.S. Department of Agriculture provides schools with a wide variety of U.S. commodities for use in school meals, including meats, grains, fruits, and vegetables. Second, our programs help improve the health of the general population, both by providing nutrition education and ensuring that the nutrition requirements for our meal programs are based on recommendations of a scientific panel that formulates what we refer to as the dietary guidelines for Americans. Third, our feeding programs offer low-income people consistent access to healthy food, re reducing hunger throughout the U.S., and finally, from a national security standpoint, this extends to ensuring that our, uh, we have military readiness among our next generation, addressing both hunger and obesity and their overall health. So among the child nutrition programs, next slide, please. The largest program we administer is the National School Lunch Program. Um, and that program serves roughly 30 million children at nearly 100,000 schools across the country each day. Our school breakfast program serves 15 million breakfasts each day in about 91,000 schools. And while we don't have time to delve into these today, two similar uh, smaller school-based programs that we administer are the Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program and Special Milk Program, which are aimed respectively at promoting fruit and vegetable consumption and ensuring availability of milk at sites not otherwise participating in our meal programs. And I believe we should be on slide three, if possible. Um, before we turn specifically to school lunch, I'd be remiss if I didn't also acknowledge as well our child and adult care food program and our summer food service program, which serve children outside of the school setting and round out USDA's suite of child nutrition programs.
So um, on the next slide, and on my screen, I think I'm, I'm not seeing slide four, but that's hopefully where we will be. Um, I would say School Lunch in America perhaps has a reputation that precedes itself. Um, and this Friday, coincidentally, in the US will be celebrating the annual School Lunch Hero Day, a, a day honoring hundreds of thousands of school nutrition professionals over the past few decades who've really strived to take school lunch from you know, an arguably undeserved reputation of mystery meat on a tray many years ago <laughs> to the more nutritious and often scratch cooked locally sourced offerings that you can see on the slide um, in these photos. By and large, studies link children's participation in the national, national school lunch program with decreased food insecurity rates, greater consumption of vegetables and milk, um, lower rates of nutri nutrient inadequacies, and an estimated reduction in obesity rates and poor health indicators. Next slide, please. And so, um, thank you very much. U.S. school meals were formally established and have been amended by various pieces of legislation over the past many decades and operationalized through numerous federal regulations, policies, and guidance. So here we have just the basic administrative structure for our school meal programs, which require partnership um, at many different levels. Very generally, the federal government has agreements with state level agencies to administer the program. And then states in turn set up agreements with school food authorities who directly operate the programs within our existing federal requirements. On an ongoing basis, USDA ensures accountability via requirements for regular food safety inspections, audits of reimbursement claims, as well as what we refer to as local administrative reviews of the program. Next slide, please. In terms of eligibility, um, any student, of course, can participate in the school meal programs and their eligibility for a free meal, a meal at a reduced price, or a meal at full price is determined based on three pricing criteria. Um, categories. So here you see children with household incomes at or below 130% of federal poverty. They're eligible for free meals. And just for context, the current U.S. federal poverty level for a family of four is an annual income of roughly 26,000 U.S. dollars. Um, those households with income between 130 and 185% of federal poverty are eligible for reduced price meals. And those with income above 185 would pay the full price for the meal. Pre-COVID pandemic, uh, roughly 76% of lunches, 87% of breakfasts were served at a free um, or reduced price rate. At the point of service, schools are required to provide students a confidential way to charge, quote unquote, charge their meal. Um, so this ensures that there's no over identification of students who receive free meals or reduced price meals. Um, and then very briefly, we determine eligibility in any one of three ways. Um, Schools can ask parents to send in an application showing their financial resources are below a certain level. And then once certified, children would receive benefits for the duration of the school year and into 30 days of the next school year. Um, we can also extend benefits by virtue of participation in other public assistance programs. Many of the US programs are means-based, um, means and so we have the same income cutoffs that allow us to use those determinations. And we also extend benefits regardless of income to foster children, runaway children, homeless, and certain migrant children. And then finally, we have um, a category known as special provisions, which are essentially a range of eligibility categories at a community level. Um, and that depending on which category um, either eliminates or reduces the use of application. Next slide, please. So in terms of funding, the main component of school meal funding that's provided by the federal government is in the form of reimbursements that we provide for every meal that's served. Each month, individual operators would submit claims detailing the number and the types of meals they served to eligible children. And then the state reimburses them at a set rate, which we adjust annually for inflation. Uh, states receive their money from the federal government by way of a letter of credit, and we have a signed federal state agreement to operate the program and ensure compliance within our federal regulations. State governments can also contribute funding, uh, matching funds, and some states offer uh, an extra per meal reimbursement to encourage things like offering breakfast, using more local foods, and so forth. 
Next slide, please. So schools have flexibility in planning menus that do meet um, best meet the needs and demographics of their student body. However, the meals must meet uh, basic specific nutrition standards in order to be eligible for federal reimbursement. So I don't expect that you can see the numbers here, um, but the basic concept is that we have nutrition standards established um, in alignment with the goals of the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, which are updated every five years. And at a very high level, the National School Lunch Program requires five components, fruits, vegetables, meat or meat alternates, grains, and milk in various quantities, depending on the grade level. Um, within the vegetable category, schools are required to offer over the course of a week um, a variety within certain subgroups of dark green vegetables, red orange um, vegetables, beans, peas, starchy, and then what we refer to as everything else under other vegetables. Next slide, please. And in addition to these meal components, um, the school lunch program and the school breakfast program nutrition standards also include dietary specifications for each age or grade group. Um, and these are daily average requirements for calories, sodium, saturated fat, and trans fat. And in this particular table, you see the calorie ranges for each age or grade group in breakfast and lunch. I'm happy to share um, plenty more details if folks are interested in the nutrition standards. So in addition to the cash reimbursements for meals served, uh, the Department of Agriculture also offers commodities to support the child nutrition programs. Um, my agency, the Food and Nutrition Service, we work hand in hand with a sister agency known as the Agricultural Marketing Service to provide commodities. Um, and we commonly refer to those as USDA foods. So while supporting food access in low-income communities, um, purchases of USDA foods also support domestic agriculture markets. And the USDA food subsidy for school lunch program is based on a rate per meal concept. So states select foods for their schools using their subsidy entitlement amount from a, a whole list of foods purchased by USDA and offered through the school lunch program. Uh, the, gov the government having significant purchasing power allows for the procurement of foods that are high in quality and, and less expensive than anything they can find in the general market. Next slide, please. Many school districts have a food service department that procures goods or services directly, um, and they base their procurement decisions on things like menu items, food variety um, needs, nutrition standards requirements, equipment, and other aspects of their food service operations. Some school districts also contract with food service management companies to operate the program and do their procurement on the school's behalf. Uh, more than half of, S of school food authorities that use food service management companies reported doing so in order to maintain compliance with our federal procurement requirements. Uh, I'll note here one key procurement requirement is specific to the Buy American provision, and that requires schools to purchase domestic agricultural commodities and food products in order to count toward a reimbursement deal. This is really aimed at safeguarding the food supply in schools, as well as supporting the U.S. economy and American farmers. And then finally, many schools are increasingly using a portion of their resources for local food purchases when possible. And USD continues to identify avenues for increasing support of local food systems across all of our child nutrition programs. Next slide. Um, to that end, I know that Lacey will be momentarily sharing in a lot more detail some of the exciting work being done in the farm to school space. So I'll just note here that um, the Department of Agriculture supports this work both via day-to-day -day integration of local foods in our existing food service operations, and through our competitive farm to school grants, which support farm to school procurement and hands-on educational experiences for children to learn more about where their food comes from, how it's grown, and how to eat healthily. Next slide. Um, because schools are permitted to sell foods outside of the school meal programs, I will also note here that the Department of Agriculture set standards for these foods as well, similarly aimed at helping improve the diet of children in school. Uh, these nutrition standards, which we fondly know as smart snacks in schools, apply through the end of the school day, um, but not to any foods that are brought from home or after school events, such as sports games, evening and weekend school activities. Next slide. 
So I focus most of today's content on the operational and supply side of our school meal programs, but I will lastly mention that USDA's efforts to also increase students' demand for healthy meals um, exists via our team nutrition initiative. Through team nutrition, we offer a, a whole diversity of nutrition education, technical assistance, and training resources to support the success of school meal programs. Um, program materials encourage students to make food and physical activity choices for a healthy lifestyle and focus on key behavioral outcomes such as eating a variety of foods, more fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, um, lower fat foods, calcium, and being more physically active. So as your coalition continues your own um, healthy school food journey, I'll conclude just by underscoring that really the successes and challenges of school meals in the United States um, can be attributed to a wide range of operational, financial, political, societal factors, but really the foundation of our efforts are rooted in this simple premise that every child is entitled to having their most basic need of nourishment met. Uh, so to that end, I'll leave you with this quote here, a few words from an elementary student that we met a few years ago um, during an observation of a school lunch program, Malia, um, who really got to the very heart of why we're so invested in these programs. So thank you for your time and interest today. And I look forward to your questions. Great, thank you so much, Marissa. I really appreciated that very informative presentation. I know myself and others will be interested um, to, to ask you and your other esteemed colleagues who are from so many years in this field about what are some of like, the critical success factors um, that you think and, and possible pitfalls, but we'll save that for later. Um, but I just wanted to, to flag that and then now pass it over to Lacey. So thank you so much, Lacey, for joining us. Thank you so much. It really is such a privilege to be here with uh, this incredible panel. I feel so honored to be with, with this esteemed group of prof professionals. Um, as Amberly mentioned, I will be discussing farm to school and the U.S. school food system. So I'll start by sharing a little bit about the National Farm to School Network, my organization. So at the National Farm to School Network, we work with our partners and communities across the country who are working to build more just, equitable, and sustainable food systems through farm to school. Our network includes over 200 partner organizations, as well as nearly 20,000 individual network members who are all focused and aligned on growing opportunities for farm to school in their local communities, their states, and across the country. So to support these communities and advance these national, state, and local opportunities, we at the National Farm to School Network really aim to be this hub, a hub for information, resources, uh, networking and advocacy. So that means for us really connecting people to the resources to support their work, ensuring that no one ever has to recreate the wheel because there's so much incredible farm to school work happening across the country. Connecting people to people because we know this work is really built around relationships. So ensuring people have that network both in their community and at their state and national level to advance this work and build in collaboration. And really importantly, connecting people to advocacy. And what are the policy opportunities at those multiple levels to facilitate the growth of farm to school, build foundations for strong community food systems and strong food, uh, local school food systems as well. So what are we talking about when we talk about farm to school? You know that language might feel different for folks and really it is kind of a vast array of ranges and of activities and strategies that connect children and their families and schools to local producers and to their local food system. And so that certainly looks different in every community based on the assets in the community, based on the resources and the interests. But we do often see at least it's one of these, what we call kind of core elements in that work. So that includes the hands-on gardening experiences, getting to know how food grows and seeing that in action, the educational understanding or food literacy, understanding how food grows, the people involved in the food system, connecting that back to our curriculum through STEM, through cultural exploration, through history and through social studies. And what we'll be kind of focusing on a little bit more today, the procurement aspect. So getting local foods into schools for meals and snacks and building those connections between the school system and the local producers and local food businesses in their area. 
And although we you know, often see these as individual activities, we do know they really work together for the most benefit. We know when kids learn about food, when they connect with that farmer potentially, they're gonna be a lot more likely to eat the food when they get to lunchtime and they get to the cafeteria. So we know those benefits are really compounded when we put those pieces together. And of course, one of the best parts of farm to school is seeing it in action. So we've got these beautiful photos of children across the country enjoying that experience of working in the garden, of learning about the food system and learning about how their food grows. And of course, enjoying those beautiful meals in the classroom or in the cafeteria. So what are those benefits that we talk about? Um, at National Farm to School Network, we like to call it a triple win, where kids are winning because they have those healthier food options, access to those healthier food options. Farmers are winning with a new market opportunity, and communities win with healthier food system and increased economic activity. And we can kind of break those benefits down a little bit by sector. And we actually have a benefits of farm to school fact sheet that I'd be happy to share that kind of shares the evidence base that we see around these different sectors. So when it comes to the economic development side, we do see increased income for some producers who join in the farm to school sales. And importantly, we see a diversified market opportunity. So it can be to kind of diversify the markets that farmers to sell to and be a consistent source of income. They know that sale is coming and they can get consistent paid. We also see compounding economic benefits that we know when we're spending money locally, that builds compounding economic benefit for the community because that money is staying local. And I'll share a little bit more about what we're seeing and specifically with farm to school there. So when it comes to public health, you know, I did mention, we do see that children who are exposed to farm to school and participate in farm to school are more likely to report enjoying target foods like fruits and vegetables and also report uh, eating more fruits and vegetables. And we actually see some studies showing uh, longevity to that, that children who participate in gardening or other farm to school activities when they're young are eating more fruits and vegetables when they get to college. So there's some early evidence that that impact can last. And we also see families uh, have increased access to local foods, particularly local produce when their communities are participating in farm to school. On the education side, of course, children are developing those concepts, those science concepts and those community concepts around where their food comes from. But we also see children excited about school. They're more engaged. They have something to look forward to. And so that goes a long way in promoting um, educational and academic engagement. On the environment side, farm to school programs um, often report reduced waste, reduced cafeteria waste. And when schools are kind of targeting producers who might be more focused in environmentally friendly practices, climate friendly practices, they can funnel their purchasing towards those producers, making a larger environmental impact. And when it comes to equity and community engagement, you know, we have early reports and, and people, of course, we know that this is a way to build community, to strengthen and shift ownership and leadership in our food system back into communities and start to alleviate some of those burdens of inequities, of quality, um, of educational experience, of that hands-on educational experience and access to foods and local foods in particular. So just a few more details on that local economic benefit from some benchmarking and case studies that we looked at a few years ago. So this demonstrates in some of the case studies that we looked at specifically here in Minneapolis public schools in Georgia, for every dollar in this model that we developed, for every dollar invested in farm to school local food purchasing, an additional 93 cents and $2.11 cents respectively was generated in local economic activity. We also see that producers who sell to schools are more likely than other producers to spend their money back in the local community. So more of that money is staying within the region when you're purchasing from the local producers who are selling to schools. So I'll touch briefly kind of on a, a modern history of farm to school. And I say that because I, I want to underscore that this concept of farm to school is by no means new. You know, since we have had educational places, we have always had um, children accessing local food. You know, there has always been that relationship and acknowledging that there has been, you know, a gap perhaps in, in some 
um, eras of school food history when that was less so, but want to acknowledge that there were certainly communities that were continuing this work. So what I've highlighted here is really just um, highlights of kind of national level coordination and just want to, you know, really acknowledge that communities have been doing this work from the grassroots for a very long time, but just wanted to pinpoint some of those opportunities that have really um, meant more national level coordination and often federal and larger levels of support. And so one of the large, one of the um, kind of first federal levels of support came in 1998 from the United States um, Initiative for Future Agriculture and Food Systems. That was some of the first uh, federal level funding going into, I believe it was eight different locations to support their farm to school initiatives and help build foundational farm to school work. In 2004 um, was one of the first years that farm to school grants, US, United States Department of Agriculture farm to school grants were approved that we heard Marissa mention, and that's really been landmark in continuing to support these initiatives. In 2007, the National Farm to School Network, my organization launched, and that really was a result of multiple organizations, over 30 organizations from across the country who were doing this local work, coming together, wanting to coordinate and support those broader national efforts. I also want to highlight in 2011, the USDA Farm to School team was launched um, and really want to uplift the importance of this federal agency and nonprofit partnership. You know, as a nonprofit or a non governmental organization, the National Farm to School Network has the capacity and opportunity to advocate and work in policy and really support the work in different ways. And we partner really closely with the folks at USDA, United States Department of Agriculture, who are focusing on this work as well, um, because they have opportunities, of course, that we don't have as, a, as an NGO. So that partnership is really vital to advancing the movement on multiple fronts. So one of the key um, pieces that the United States Department of Agriculture Office of Community Food Systems that farm to school team does is the national census, the national farm to school census. So every about three years, we get a really strong look at what are the activities of farm to school across the country. This goes to every school food authority or school district um, to help understand what other farm to school practices. So this most recent data from 2018 and 2019, we see that over 65% of those school food authorities are participating in some type of farm to school activity. So that's 42.8 million children who've been reached and over 67,000 schools participating. So we do have really strong participation. We know schools are excited about this opportunity, but we certainly have a ways to go to ensure that all children have access to these activities and access to local foods. And all of this information, they do such a great job of making it really accessible to see much more detail about what activities are, are um, being participated in and also can kind of break down by state as well. So schools and school districts are able to see kind of how they compare to other schools and districts across the country. So two of the big kind of key investments happening right now around local foods and farm to school. One of them Marissa mentioned about the uh, USDA farm to school grant funding. Um, really, it's so exciting to see this amount of funding going into the grant program because it's such an influential opportunity for schools, districts, and states across the country to either plan for, uh, expand, um, and build upon their farm to school work. So we see this year a $12 million was invested in those competitive grant programs. Um, so that's 176 grants, over 6,000 schools and 1.4 million students. I will, will say that still is, is kind of a drop in the bucket to the number of applications they receive. Um, there is still a lot of really wonderful unfunded projects and that funding is still not meeting the demand of folks who want to be doing this work in their districts and states. Another really exciting um, initiative that really came out of the challenges that schools and communities and producers face during the pandemic is this local foods and schools cooperative agreement. So the federal government is able to provide kind of lump sums of money to each state to purchase local foods for schools. 
And so states are kind of right now figuring out what that looks like. Some states are doing the coordination and purchasing themselves. Some states are contracting with aggregators or food hubs. Some states are providing funding directly to the schools to be able to do the purchasing. So states are kind of in the process right now figuring out we've got this money, how do we make it work and how do we use it to best support our schools and our food systems. So it's a really exciting initiative that we hope will have some great impact for those local producers and schools. I'll also mention that there is quite a bit of funding coming through other USDA programs to really bolster local and regional food systems that we know is such an important uh, foundation to creating farm to school opportunity. In the US, state farm to school policy is also a really important component of supporting the work. Uh, as of 2020, oh, 41 states, the District of Columbia, Columbia, and even the U.S. Virgin Islands had some sort of farm to school policy in place. And certainly there are kind of different degrees of policy. Some states may just have a proclamation for, for farm to school month, or some states might have really well-funded comprehensive programs that support purchasing, that support um, positions, that support grant programs. Um, so one of the initiatives that we really see a lot of interest in and is kind of quick growing across many states is a local food incentive program where states may provide an additional reimbursement on top of that reimbursement that Marissa talked about that the federal government provides for meals, but an additional reimbursement for schools that are including local foods in their meals. So we see um, about 14 states have some form of that procurement incentive program. And of course, we would love to see that um, advance to the national level, and it certainly is continuing to grow across states. So as I wrap up, um, thinking about what's next for Farm to School, how do we continue to grow? And I think there's um, one area that we see a lot of opportunity. I'm sure we'll hear from Dr. Poppendick about kind of opportunity for universal free meals. And what is our opportunity to for Farm to School, for local food purchasing to be integrated and a part of those universal free meal initiatives? We also hold really strongly as we move forward the need to ensure that our farm to school work as well as our school meal programs have that real center in equity. And certainly at the National Farm to School Network and USDA has also really announced and put forward their initiatives in centering their work in equity as well. And for us, the National Farm to School Network, part of that commitment to equity is thinking about how can local food purchasing really build power in communities and certainly you know, prioritize local, but also be thinking about how can it contribute to economic justice, environmental justice, high quality health impact, prioritizing racial equity, respecting workers and educators and animal welfare, and just acknowledging the real integration of these different sectors and the opportunity for local purchasing for school food programs to be impactful in communities and these multiple areas. And so that's part of the reason why the National Farm to School Network has really set our sights on ensuring that all of our work is really shifting us towards what we call our call to action, um, that we want to gather our partners around and move us all towards that communities hold power in a racially just food system and really being intentional about how farm to school, how local food purchasing can really meaningfully drive us towards this vision of a food system that we want to see in the future. So that is all I have for you. I'm happy to share more information and we have a lot of great resources on our website, including some of those economic benchmarking studies, the benefits of farm to school fact sheet, a lot of information about policies coming out um, at farmtoschool.org. And I'm happy to answer any questions at the end and um, wish Canada the best of luck as they move forward and kind of this exciting work that you're embarking on. Great, thank you so much, Lacey, um, for the presentation and all your leadership in the farm school movement in the US. I know we have been inspired by what's happening there, um, both on the pro programmatic and the research front. Um, I know myself as a farm to school researcher, I've always been very thrilled to see the, the publications coming out of um, your organization and the partnerships you've done with great um, academic institutions. So thank you so much for that today. Um, now I'm gonna pass it off to Dr. Poppendick. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'm happy to be here and uh, thank both the previous presenters. Um, I thought I knew a lot about school food in the US, but I, I learned, so thank you very much. 
Um, I have put a subtitle on my uh, my introductory slide here to say a cautionary tale. I, mean, I think about my mother saying to me, do as I say, not as I do. And I think that's my fundamental advice to Canada. I think you can learn a lot from the mistakes we've made along the way. Uh, next slide, please. Um, school food began in the United States um, as did many of our public programs were originally private programs, voluntary charitable programs. Um, in the US, it was during the progressive era, the late 1800s, first decade of the, the 1900s. Um, and I've put up a famous quote here from Robert Hunter's seminal work, Poverty. It is utter folly from the point of view of learning to have a compulsory school law which compels children in that weak physical and mental state which results from poverty to drag themselves to school and to sit at their desks learning little or nothing. A hungry child cannot learn. And um, I thought about that when uh, Marissa was listen listing the fundamental goals of, the, of our food programs, our school food programs. Um, so programs were begun in the US, mostly in large cities, but also in some rural areas. They were completely local. They were often initiated by women's organizations who once they demonstrated that the program was helpful, that it made a difference, um, sought support from municipal governments. It was definitely the spread of compulsory education, compulsory school attendance that brought this to widespread public attention because it brought into the public schools many children from very poor households. The households became poorer because the children were no longer able to participate in the wage earning activities because they had to be in school and families were um, destitute. Um, but there was also support in these early years from something called the school hygiene movement, which was particularly concerned about how children um, got their midday meal in the US in most large cities. Elementary schools were neighborhood schools and children were presumed to go home for lunch, but high schools were fewer and far between. Not everyone went to high school. They were um, located much further from where uh, students lived. And the practice had grown up of selling vendors outside or at the edge of the schoolyard, selling uh, food to children. Um, and it was very often not only unhealthy food, but unhygienic food. So these two concerns, the, the basic needs of very poor children and school hygiene um, got together to produce this pattern or network of local programs. Next slide, please. Uh, federal participation in school food in the United States did not happen until the Great Depression of the 1930s. And the, the farm economy of the United States was in deep distress even before the Industrial Depression began. At the end of World War I, um, farmers found their market for Europe. They had been shipping vast quantities of food to Europe. They had been um, a lot of major purchases by the federal government. This all began and the federal government Congress canceled the war credits to our, our allies and the market for American farm products collapsed and prices dropped, uh, but many farmers had taken on additional debt. They had mortgaged their properties to expand during World War I. So the depression in agriculture started almost 10 years before the, the Great Depression of the 1930s. Um, and by the time the farm depression, um, the industrial depression hit, we had a situation which I have uh, often referred to as bread lines knee deep in wheat, which was a slogan during the depression years. But uh, people were, were going hungry while farm surpluses were going to waste and farmers were losing their farms to foreclosure by the banks and to uh, repossession. Uh, and this led in some situations to very high profile uh, destruction of food and that caused outrage. Um, in the, the federal realm, a very dramatic slaughter of baby pigs to keep them from growing up to be big hogs and an impending glut on the hog market led to a massive um, public relations disaster for the new Roosevelt administration. 
Um, and so the federal government created a, a little corporation actually to begin procuring farm surpluses from the uh, farmers who were on the edge of going under and distributing them through the relief apparatus to people in need. Um, and gradually, this little corporation, the Federal Surplus Relief Corporation, also began making grants of surplus commodities to school systems that were trying to feed children. Um, unemployment also led uh, to school food work relief projects through the Works Progress Administration and the National Youth Administration, because we had not only surplus crops, but also surplus labor. Um, Many of the industrial workers who were unemployed because of the Great Depression were women, but the typical work project of road building or school construction or what have you wasn't seen as suitable work for women, and the school lunchroom provided an opportunity. Next slide, please. So we had an ad hoc, accidental, unplanned, improvised, experimental, and temporary federal engagement with school food that began in the in the Great Depression. And this set of factors, this improvised program shaped US school food fundamentally and profoundly. So you may have wondered at some point why school pro food programs in the United States are run by the Department of Agriculture um, and not by uh, the Department of Education. May I have the next slide, please? Um, but it, it is a, a long-term legacy of the Depression era origin. This, is, this illustration is a, a bit of a cheat. This is actually the farm bill, all 1,400 pages of it. And in fact, school food is not covered in the farm bill. It's covered in something called child nutrition reauthorization that is supposed to happen every five years and for which we are now seven years overdue. Um, but for the crucial formative period, um, the, uh, the agriculture committees of Congress were the ones shaping school food policy. Now it's the education and labor committee in the house. It's still the agriculture committee in the Senate. Um, and the programs were administered by the Department of Agriculture and they were linked to the disposal of surplus farm commodities and eventually funded by a unique permanent authorization that was intended to support farm income. It was a provision that was created and seen as a kind of payback to farmers a recompense to farmers for the damage that had been done to them by the tariff. So it allocates to the support of farm income um, a third of every year's customs receipt. And the section 32 is still a significant source of school food funding. Next, next slide, please. So we were barely emerging from the Great Depression, or perhaps we're not emerging from it when World War II came along and war changed everything as it does. Um, Marissa mentioned um, national security as one of the overarching goals of our child nutrition programs. It came to the fore during World War II when um, studies showed that people rejected for health reasons by their draft boards had often been uh, reported as malnourished in childhood. Um, of course, the farm surpluses that were the driving factor of federal participation disappeared during World War II. We went from surpluses to rationing in the short order. Um, there was a great deal of concern among the farm leadership in Congress um, about what would happen after the war. Um, what had happened after World War I left an enduring thing, and that was reflected in an act called Glass-Steagall, which was a commitment to support farm prices for two years after the end of hostilities. And this led to a concern to keep those school food programs alive. Let's keep the school lunchroom open because we're going to need it after the war. There was also a, a concern about mothers being in the workforce. Rosie the Riveter out there uh, building ships was not home fixing lunch. Um, so this whole war ethos changed the attitude. Um, in the looking forward toward the possibility of rationing, the War Food Administration asked a group of nutritionists to specify what are the basic food needs, and they created um, the recommended da daily allowances, um, which as I know, 
a now updated term, but was the RDAs for a very long while. Um, and the uh, when Congress, you can uh, move the, the next slide, but when Congress decided to provide cash indemnities for the support of schoolrooms, the War Food Administration said, okay, well, let's make sure these meals provide at least one third of the recommended daily allowances for calories and other nutrients. So the nutrition standards that Marissa outlined for us have their, um, their roots in the type A lunch <laughs> that was created and endured with very few changes on up until the 1970s and is still the, the basis for uh, the nutrition standards that you saw. Um, so Congress made annual appropriations hotly debated um, because this touched hot button issues in the United States about uh, independence and self-support and self-reliance and what's the appropriate role of the federal government. Um, but they did succeed in getting them through. Schools began to ask for a permanent program. Living with year-to-year -year appropriations um, is difficult for any functioning institution. So educators and children's advocates lobbied for a permanent program. Um, and the National School Lunch Act was passed and signed in June 1946. And this is a, a picture of Harry Truman signing it. And it provided an across the board subsidy for all meals served. And it provided that federal funds were to be matched by funds from within the states, including the fees the children paid. Next slide, please. Um, and that proved to be a very uh, crucial or important factor um, in the long run development of, of school food in the United States. So participating schools and states had to agree to meet the nutrition standards, that type A meal, uh, to feed needy children free or at a reduced price, to utilize surplus commodities to now we say USDA foods because they are not necessarily su surplus, but at this point they were still thinking in terms of surplus commodities to maintain adequate and transparent records. And it provided that the funds were to be distributed by state agencies, not directly by USDA. And this was to reassure Southern segregationists that USDA would not be able to use this program um, to attack uh, school segregation in the American South. Next, uh, next slide, please. This is the picture there was from a 1966 type A meal. So I want to fast forward to the late 1960s from that interim period, school meals were largely a subsidy to the, the growing American middle class as new schools were built in the Levitt towns and the new suburbs. They were built with kitchens and cafeterias, but some of the schools in older uh, parts of the, the system did not have those assets. Late 1960s, we had a shocking rediscover of hunger in the United States. This is a picture of Robert Kennedy on a famous uh, Senate hearing trip to the Mississippi Delta where he met starving, very hungry families firsthand um, in 1967, pretty much anything Robert Kennedy did was news. He was the younger brother of our slain president, JFK. He was, uh, had been attorney general. He was the Senator from New York and he was running um, for the democratic nomination for the president. So his trip to the Mississippi Delta brought national attention to hunger and um, a group of foundations and nonprofits mobilized to conduct a series of hearings, um, produced reports. Next slide, please. Like this one, Hunger USA. Um, the Poor People's March, the uh, March on Washington. May I have the next slide? Um, arrived in Washington carrying copies of Hunger USA. But for school food, the crucial study was one done by um, the Committee on School Lunch Participation, which was a coalition of national women's organizations like the YWCA and the National Council of Jewish Women and the National Council of Black Women, and some others. And they found that only about 2 million of the nation's 50 million school children were receiving free or reduced price lunches. Only about a third of the 6 million officially poor children um, of school age. 
So this was shocking. The, the program was serving the middle class well, it was serving the poor hardly at all. There was no legal definition of unable to pay full cost and the funding structure provided no special reimbursement to schools for meals served free. So in essence, schools that had a lot of middle-class parents could afford to serve poor children free, but schools in which the majority of children were poor didn't have the funds because the funds basically came from the payments by the middle-class or by paying children. Next slide, please. So this was a situation in which outrage brought action. And over the course of the last year of the 60s and the first few years of the 70s, Congress overhauled the school food programs. It created national eligibility standards for free and reduced price meals. And Marisha shared those with you. 130% uh, of the poverty level get you a free meal. Um, the US poverty level, poverty uh, measurement structure is so unrealistic so out of date, even though it's adjusted annually for the cost of living, it has never been adjusted to address the changes in the way we live, that we no longer can use the poverty level itself, we have to use multiples of it. Um, it created, and this was the crucial piece, federal reimbursement for free and reduced price meals. Um, and this was created as an entitlement for children in schools that chose to participate and therefore had what we call performance funding. And this is important if you're thinking about how to do this in Canada. Um, it's not a funding cap. We don't run out of reimbursement funds for, for school meals. Um, there is a built-in automatic adjustment of reimbursement rates for inflation. It used to be every six months. Now it's every year. Anybody who's been living with food pricing inflation knows that we need to, um, to make use of our modern computer technology to do these adjustments more frequently. Um, the little pilot school breakfast program that had been begun earlier was moved from pilot to, to permanent status and made available to all schools. And thus we could say the programs reached their modern form. Um, next slide, please. I just want to say that there was a huge legacy from this period of effective action and advocacy, the creation of a network of state and local and national advocacy organizations. Next slide, please. I put the National Anti-Hunger Policy Conference ad up there. Um, there have been recurring issues about plate waste and palatability, um, about cost and accountability, um, the uh, means test, schools are not well suited to administer a means test. They, they are, don't have that kind of relationship with parents and, and households. And so there have been recurring challenges from the right about serving free meals to kids who should have had to pay the reduced price or uh, reduced price meals to children who should have had to pay the full price um, and concern from progressives about children who were misclassified and should have been getting free or reduced price meals. There are the recurring uh, concerns about the nutrition standards, but the biggest um, problem in my assessment for the school food system has been the three tier system. It was a very important reform when it came in, but in the long run, it has, well, maybe poisoned the program is too strong, but it excludes some children in need because we use a single national standard for eligibility, but costs of living vary dramatically in the United States from place to place. It shames students who participate in some situations where stigma attaches to participating in the school meal. And that shame creeps over into the food itself so that many children give school food a reputation problem. I wanna to say to Lacey that I don't think that anything has been more important than farm to school in combating the, the reputation challenge that school food places. Um, but nonetheless, the three-tier system deters some children from participating, even if they are eligible for free meals. Um, next slide, please. So, when I turn my attention to the current situation, um, I wanna say that when I began researching school food, 
um, which was in 2003, the big issue of the day was obesity um, and the um, shocking discovery that while school food meals had calorie minimums, they didn't have calorie ma maximums. Um, and analysis suggesting that school food was contributing to the obesity epidemic. Um, and so that was the high profile debate of the, the 2000s, say the, the Healthy Hunger-Free Kids Act, the Child Nutrition Reauthorization was passed at the very end of the decade in 2010. And as I say, all the attention was focused on the nutrition st standards, but buried in there, was something I think of as stealth legislation. It was the community eligibility provision, which allowed individual schools, groups of schools, or even entire districts in which at least 40% of the students were direct certified for free meals to feed all children from free and be um, reimbursed according to a complex formula. When I say direct certified, that's what Marissa was referring to when she said, well, one way we figure eligibility is but is by identifying students whose families are already participating in another means-tested program like SNAP food stamps. Next slide, please. So community eligibility, this is a, a picture of the cover for free for all. For nutrition professionals and anti-hunger advocates, this was a big step forward to, you know, toward universal free school meals. That's been the agenda since 1946, since the National School Lunch Act was passed. And pretty much, if you talk to people who are involved in the day-to-day -day and week-to-week -week operation of school food, they will tell you that a universal program makes more sense, that we are wasting vast amounts of energy, effort, and money in distinguishing among um, the ability to pay of households. Um, and we do a very poor job of it when we do it through household applications. The direct certification error rate is, is low, about 2%, but the error rate for household-based applications is 20%. One in five applications is misclassified. Next slide, please. So enter COVID-19. Um, the, the use of the community eligibility provision had been expanding. It was creating terrific opportunities for research on what happens when schools do feed everyone. Along came COVID and school districts throughout the country um, were stumbling. Um, as schools closed down, children were cut off from the meals. They were supposed to be learning at home. Um, school food service knew this and they, um, they arose to the occasion. Next slide, please. This is a, a school in the Bronx that put out the meals um, on the fence in uh, um, uh, beautiful green bags. Uh, I'm sorry, next slide. So the school systems responded heroically, but the challenge was enormous. And USDA stepped in, stepped up to issue wa waivers that allowed all schools to move to universal free school um, provision for the duration of the pan pandemic and really increased the reimbursement rates. Um, and these waivers have been extended through the current school year, the 21-22 school year. Um, and those of us who've been working on this and for this for years, and I, the, I was part of the group that finally succeeded in getting universal free school years meals in New York City in 2017 under the provisions of the community eligibility. We, we hoped that this would be the turning point, that we could wake Congress up to the fact that, that we are paying far too high, to, high a price to not feed certain children. Um, so we hoped that Congress would uh, include funding to permit continuation of the free-for-all policy in the Build Back Better bill, but as you know, that bill has never even made it to the floor. Efforts to persuade Congress to extend the waivers for another year have been unsuccessful. Um, so my ear to the ground, school food professionals and child advocates are dreading the return to parental applications with the start of the next school year. Um, next slide, please. So what we're doing to try to address this, first, um, we are conducting research on the impact of universal free school meals, trying to get the scientific basis to build our case. Um, 
we are continuing to work for federal uh, universal or at least expansion of the community eligibility in the next child nutrition reauthorization as i said it's now seven years overdue and um it's not clear that it will take place again this year um conducting campaigns for statewide universal provision we had a success in california and one in maine and that has galvanized um, state school food activists around the country um, so that there are eight or nine active campaigns underway and four more in the on the drawing board um, we have been working for one year extensions of the universal to be funded by the state and that um, Massachusetts has now put that in the budget it still has to be passed by the Senate but um, it's looking good um, so other states are following suit um, to try and uh, obtain these one year extensions funded by the states. The Center on Budget and Policy Priorities has identified states that can use COVID fiscal recovery funds for that purpose. So it would be a pass through in a sense of some federal funds. And final slide, please. Okay, so my final slide is about my advice to Canada. Um, and I know it's a lot easier to say than it is to do, but I, my advice to you is to avoid creating a means test. Do what you can do for all students. If it's brunch <laughs> and it's minimal, do it for everybody and then work to expand it. But don't create a system that divides students based on their family's ability to pay. It, it works okay in the elementary schools because kids don't care, but as soon as they get on toward junior high, they are working to establish their identities. And the last thing they want is to be tagged as poor. Um, and it has a way, no matter um, what the actions are taken to try to protect their privacy, it, they find out. Um, the focus on learning, health, and community building. Um, Debbie, I was interested in what you said in the introduction that your um, national mandate calls for the, the Secretary or Department of Agriculture and of Social Development. Does that include um, whatever governs schools, the education department? Because education needs to be in there from the outset. Otherwise, they have a tendency to regard school food as kind of like the help, you know, some, some non-education function, when in fact, um, as a, a food activist said to me, well, what the kid has for lunch in the cafeteria, that is her nutrition education for the day. The cafeteria should be regarded as a really central part of the school and of education. Um, pay attention to the power of procurement to promote health, farm survival, sustainability, local economy, good jobs, animal welfare, um, those values that, that Lacey mentioned for farm to school. Listen to those most affected, the students and their parents, so that you create a, a governance structure that has room for input and respect local differences in food preferences and food resources. Um, that's a, uh, a not too subtle way of saying, think very carefully about any nutrition standards that you impose, that they be things that are compatible with, with local food systems. Canada is a very diverse country with, with vastly different um, agricultural and other regions. Um, so that's my, my quick advice <laughs> um, to, to Canada. I, you have an opportunity to get it right. And I really congratulate you for this series of webinars to look at what can be learned from other societies that have been trying this longer. You, you have the chance to to learn from all our mistakes and do it right. And I congratulate you. And Thank I'm done. You. Thank you so much, Janet. Really appreciate that very informative presentation. Everything from the history to those last key insights. Um, before I turn it over to question answers, I just wanted to acknowledge that unfortunately we did have a challenge with um, the, admin, the admin process of admitting people um, and the event by event bright page. So unfortunately not as many people could join us live, um, but we have members across Canada and some of which it's very early for them, um, like you, Marissa. Uh, so they'll be definitely catching the replay and we'll be happy to circulate this far and wide as this was a highly anticipated um, webinar. So thanks so much again. 
Um, with that being said, I'm going to pose the first question, but because of the intimate nature of our conversation today, I'm going to invite um, people to raise their hand um, so I can turn it over to you to ask your question live. Um, but to kick it off, I wanted to first pose um, a question for Janet just to follow up on not only a conversation we previously had, um, but something in your last slide about avoiding the means testing. As I shared with you, Janet, um, there's quite a few communities in Canada and some provinces like PEI who have been doing a, what we call a pay what you can or a sliding scale model. And I just wanted to get your take on um, your thoughts about that model um, in terms of opportunities or maybe um, pitfalls or, or challenges you might see with that type of model. Well, I'm touched by the spirit of it. <laughs> Um, but I see major pitfalls. Um, and one is that school food, typically, once you are up and running a large program, you're doing your ordering and procurement a year in advance um, or a, an extended time frame. So not knowing how much <laughs> you have coming in as revenue from the, the paying customers um, it, it makes it very difficult to manage. Um, and I would think from an administrative perspective, this, this would be difficult. And secondly, it creates a kind of moral hazard, um, to use a term that typically conservatives in the United States have worried about, of creating a situation in which kind of the more responsible and civic minded a household is, the more it might be inclined to pay. And I think over time, and then conversely, households that don't give a fig <laughs> about the school budget or what have you might be voluntarily paying less unrelated to need. Um, and I think over time that re breeds resentment. So I would rather see, like I said, I'd rather see you do what you can for everyone. <laughs> and then if communities want to try and raise resources in the private sector to enhance their local programs, that would be um, a way to engage voluntary contributions. But I, I'm concerned about the sustainability of a pay what you prefer. <laughs> pay what you can approach. Um, on the other hand, given the, the number and diversity of academics that you all have been able to mobilize to look at these things, I'm sure you have somebody looking at it. And if it works, I'm happy to stand down. Thank you so much, Janet. I'm now going to turn it over to Mary McKenna, Dr. Mary McKenna, to ask a question. Hi, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, really, really great information and really helpful to, to have. Um, I have three questions, but I, I'll, I'll pose them, but I, maybe we won't answer all three because I, I don't want to uh, <laughs> monopolize uh, time. But um, one is that we have the Canada's Food Guide, which says that you know half your plate is vegetables and fruits. And I was looking at the nutrition standards that you put up, Marissa, and that it's sort of more one, 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 one if in terms of a, a daily, daily uh, um, a, a, um, pr provision. And so I was wondering, um, and, and it sort of relates to Lacey too, in terms of, you know, local farm to school and more vegetables and, and, and fruits. I know that's not the only local, but it's a big emphasis of it. And you have your vegetable and fruit program. Do you have any comments for us on, so question one is comments for us on, you know, increasing the provision of, of fruits and vegetables and, and the implications of that, just in, in, you know, receptivity to provision of, et cetera. Um, a second is um, the universality aspect is 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 fascinating and and Amberly and I have done some some work. I'm a professor at the University of New Brunswick and um, we coined the term or we think we might have coined it of nested universality. So kind of what what you're talking about, Janet, would be uh, 
we would consider nested universality that you know if they reach a certain threshold then then all of the students within that school we only we have provinces and territories that are providing about 93 million dollars to our um, school food and we have it's very complicated in Canada we have lots of we have lots of charities and all of that and so um, perhaps this may be more for Marissa but day-to-day -day monitoring so when when Amberly and I were trying to to get information we, we we struggled to get information consistent information and some provinces and territories weren't compiling it even so just any any helpful tips on kind of at least minimal monitoring that you would encourage um, schools or whoever to be to be doing. And I will make one comment just you you were insightful Jen and in saying about you know what about education so we do not have a federal ministry of education, we have a council of ministers of education and. Um, so there is and, and there is no and I know there is is in the US and and health, uh, which we do have health Canada. Uh, much of health is devolved to the provinces and territories, but we do have Health Canada and they have not, they're not formally identified as part of this mandate letter. So just letting you know, but thank you again. Well, I'll respond to the nested um, universality part of that and um, then turn it over to Marissa um, on the other fronts. Um, Nested universality is better than no universality. And we have seen it in the United States because that's essentially what um, the community eligibility option is. And, you know, we are trying now it, in the US, it, schools have to have 40% what we call identified students. Those are students who are whose eligibility has been established because their families participate in SNAP or TANF, the welfare, or their foster children homeless children, runaway or migrant youth. Um, so if a school's got 40% of its kids that fit in those categories, then they're eligible for the um, community eligibility. And then they get, they feed all the kids and they get reimbursed at the full federal free rate, which is what, 366, you said, Marissa, um, for 1.6 times the percentage of of identified students. So if you've got 62 or 63% of your students in that category, you, you come out ahead financially and those communities have been quick to adopt uh, the community eligibility. But if you're down closer to that 40% threshold, you have to find state and local funds to make up the, the difference. And we're working, we're working you know, we've got a pincer movement going. We're working at the national level to increase the 1.6 to 1.8 or two. And we've got um, communities and sta state campaigns going to get states to pick up the tab to fill in the, the difference for local schools. But I would go for total universal <laughs> if I could get it. Marissa. Thank you, um, Janet. So I guess starting with the monitoring question, um, certainly I would say the complexities of monitoring really are proportionate to the complexities of the laws and regulations that govern your program. Um, and in the US, our monitoring is um, accordingly quite extensive and complex with the federal, um, state, and local levels. I think it's always a balance between that carrot and stick method. Um, for us, we try to start from a place of, I, I like to call it collaborative compliance. Um, if our programs are not um, meeting the requirements of the program, we really emphasize with our state and local partners to work closely with um, program sites to understand the rules, problem solve, provide a lot of hands-on technical assistance um, to hopefully help them meet their requirements. Um, at some point, if that, that doesn't work, then during the review, review process, we work with partners to develop a corrective action plan and they have a set amount of time um, to implement corrective actions to meet the requirements. Um, in the most egregious of examples, which I want to say are few and far between, there uh, is the option to withhold reimbursement um, if there are recurring or very extreme issues with non-compliance. But um, like I said, we. I'd like to, to say that we, we rarely get to that point um, and most of our partners really want to do the right thing and meet the program requirements, requirements and so just need some support to get there. But are most of the shortfalls 
um, in meeting the nutrition requirements or in accurately characterizing students for reimbursable the eligibility levels? It really is a wide range. Um, I, I certainly eligibility uh, meeting nutrition standards, but even things in terms of, um, for example, we have a lot of requirements around um, civil rights statements that need to be on all of our resources. So even little um, minor things that I would say minor in the sense they can be easily fixed. Um, sometimes those make up the bulk of their, our review findings. And so um, really looking at opportunities to help folks meet, meet those easily. Um, and then on the um, fruits and vegetable question, and I certainly want to um, turn it over to Lacey to share her feedback as well. Um, I would just say, one, I should have added the caveat that we are in the process of um, updating our nutrition standards to meet the latest dietary guidelines for Americans. So those federal guidelines, um, which are put together by the Department of Agriculture, uh, jointly with the Health and Human Services Department. Um, those are updated every five years, and uh, there is just a little bit of a lag in terms of interpreting those and then applying them to our program operations. So we are right in the middle of actually updating our nutrition standards to reflect um, the, the latest dietary guidelines and um, so that you may see some impact on the fruit and vegetable and other uh, meal component requirements. Um, and then certainly there's recognition of um, wanting to be able to support greater fruit and vegetable um, uh, so supply in the school meals and, and um, intake of them. And so you see that with our fresh fruit and vegetable program where we're sort of supplementing meals with snacks of fruits and vegetables during the day um, with some limited funding and certainly more promotion of um, our farm to school effort. Um, so I'll turn it over to Lacey. Thanks, Marissa. Um, you know, I think what I'd add, one barrier I think for a lot of schools is uh, a lot of schools in the United States don't have capacity anymore for scratch cooking for preparation for those fruits and vegetables. Um, so oftentimes that means that they're relying on um, more processed fruits or vegetables that can be less appealing. And so I think that there is, you know, certainly opportunity, one, to support um, uh, school food service staff in honing those skills and supporting, you know, really appetizing preparations for fruits and vegetables. Um, and I think there's also a place there for some like local minimal processing as well to make that easier and take some of the burden off of schools. So thinking about what is that full that whole flow from producers to schools that can help support um, high quality fruits and vegetables that support appealing opportunity options for kids. And um, I think we talked before this about, you know, what are the opportunities to support appeal, you know, salad bars where kids can have choices, um, getting students engaged in, in um, choosing menus and, and voting on their favorites and really getting kid, kids engaged in those educational opportunities to overcome, you know, what a lot of folks perceive as a barrier in kind of student acceptance. So I think that comes back to that kind of where all of those components of farm to school fit together in the education and the experience and connecting to producers um, to overcome some of those barriers. Great, thank you so much to the three of you for those great answers. Um, next, we have Kirsty to ask a question. Kirsty is a PhD student at the University of Lakehead here in Ontario. One. Thanks so much for those fantastic presentations. And I'm sorry, I missed Marissa's. I joined sort of halfway through Lacey's. Um, so my question may be applicable to all of you because I'm just not sure exactly the content of Marissa's. But um, uh, this comes from something that Janet was mentioning. So you were talking about that you and other researchers are continuing um, to measure impacts and try to present that as you know your evidence base for continuing with what at the moment is sort of a universal program. And so I'm curious, sort of as a newer researcher to um, this area, what impacts are most valuable um, to policymakers? So what do you feel you need to show to policymakers? So is it so what some of the literature I've been reading talks about, um, good nutrition equals better scores, like better test scores, um, or good nutrition, just, you know, having, um, having school meals equals better nutrition. So kids are healthier. So are those the things that are most important as an example, or are there other impacts that you're seeing outside of that, maybe to children and their families, sort of more holistic impacts. And also maybe this is for everyone, uh, maybe for Lacey more, what are you hearing from families and maybe communities about other impacts? Um, to kids and to their families and maybe to communities. And if those things are different um, from what policymakers are asking for, how do you sort of manage that? And what, what do you maybe do with those other impacts that you feel are important? 
um, but maybe aren't sort of being prioritized by policymakers. Thank you. Can I jump in with one quick one? Because you're absolutely right that health and performance, academic performance have been the big areas where we focused. But I just also want to say that I think it matters to policy makers um, that school food jobs are good jobs and they are particularly good jobs for single parents of whom we have many in our country because they're on the school calendar. So I always try to also point out that growing the program, the universal raises participation, we've demonstrated that, and that growing the program grows a set of jobs that are compatible with meeting basic needs for vulnerable families. So. I would just quickly add, um, of course, depending on uh, the persuasions of the political leadership in your country at the time, um, the economic argument is always of interest. And so um, as an example, with our community eligibility pro um, provision that Janet described, um, that's one where we've really tried to focus on the benefits of being able to reduce administrative burden and thereby reduce some of the costs for um, our local program operators. Yeah, crucial. I think it's that's a crucial argument because it appeals to a different part of the political spectrum. Yeah, I would echo in the United States, at least, you know, that need to be working across the aisle and then that economic impact specifically around um, bolstering local food systems and creating pathways for local producers. Um, that's something that seems to resonate across the aisle. And I think we do see a lot of interest, you know, this is what we hear from families. And I think there's an increasing level of interest in um, really that whole child health approach. What are the social emotional impacts for children? What are the... Um, you know, we recognize that children have been through incredible trauma over the past two years and how can food-based approaches, how can support from school in multiple ways um, really support families and kind of a whole child health approach. So I think coming out of um, the pandemic, that's of particular importance um, for child and then of course, you know, family economic viability as well. What is the role of school food in importing family economic viability? One of the things that Lacey mentioned in her presentation was the ability to uh, channel procurement resources, purchases, to farmers who are doing ecologically sound farming. And I think at a broader scale, as we try to wake up to the climate change realities, um, the capacity to um, enhance the market for sustainably raised foods for foods that that don't um, take a big toll on the carbon budget is important. I was shocked in a webinar the other day about um, pu public procurement in New York City to see that our by far our hugest carbon impact comes from purchasing milk because milk is a required component of every school meal. Um, and I think you have an opportunity there in Canada to build the climate sensitivity in from the outset in a way that in the US we're struggling to allow climate to be part of our dietary guidelines um, that are the basis. Thank you so much. And now we're gonna have a question from Debbie Field, our coordinator. Great. Uh, I'm just putting in the chat uh, the coalition's principles because they're so connected to so many of the things we're just talking about right now. Um, just want to take my hand down. Um, something that hasn't uh, that I wanted to ask all three of you, and maybe to Jan first, uh, and then to the others, is to puzzle out a little bit about this health moment because uh, I was very intrigued, Jan. Because uh, it would have been in those years that I first met you when you when you described the obesity diabetes conversation and a lot of our work has been heavily influenced by that moment and the whole concept of the health crisis of the child. Um, as Mary said, we always have said in Canada that we want the Minister of Health to be responsible for the mandate and we have this new food guide and it's very again very interesting Jen what you just said around milk because our food guide uh, along is actually, we, all, we always say it's the best food guide in the world, similar to Brazil's and even 
with Michelle Obama's plate, it's a similar approach, but we have a glass of water, not a glass of milk. Mm -hmm. And we won that through a very complex process that took us years of convincing Health Canada to firewall the consultation and only have health experts and community people in the room, no industry. So we're trying to mirror that now as we go through the guidelines for our school food program. And uh, we mostly are saying we want the food served in school food to be, uh, as Mary said, this new food guide. However, we're also very aware, and I just put it in the chat, that the food guide does not make any sense for First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people in Canada um, for a variety of reasons in terms of both the cost of the food, but also in terms of eating patterns. So we're also very aware that a whole community-based approach, and Jan, you referenced this too, uh, a diverse country with large uh, Muslim populations in our cities, um, a whole way of looking at food uh, in a way that we've all learned globally. Um, and in that, it's not just about money. In fact, uh, it was, I think, probably the most complicated one for me personally was in fact our Scotland webinar where we have one of the best resource programs in the world, but we have a very top down, full food service, no community development, no student or parental engagement. So we're actually looking at it completely differently, uh, bottom up, whatever you get very much as you said, Jan, but universally around health uh, and working parents and actually women as workers so we have something called equity-based uh, budgeting in Canada, where they have to actually look at every item in the budget in relationship to how it impacts on women. So we're in this amazing spot where they are actually asking us to help them develop the policies. And we're looking at something that would allow for, uh, I mean, I like what Mary suggested in terms of nesting, but the language I've always used is universal on the road to universality. So as long as you don't discriminate in any school, that's universal. And we, I think we're gonna convince them of that. So I think we've won the fight because of your crisis in the United States, that they will not have a means tested program. The way it might roll out though, is to those schools who currently have programs, which would mean those schools that are in so-called low income cutoff neighborhoods, because that would have been the original provincial and city funding. So if you, started tomorrow to cost share what is going on on the ground, you would cost share programs in so-called low-income neighborhoods that are universal. That's where we are. But I, I, anyway, my question is more this health question and how, what is your new thinking? All three of you are in a very different location to the health crisis because the health crisis is part of how middle and upper class families are gonna wanna participate. So just some thoughts on the health crisis. Well, I'm just sitting here. I'm I'm stuck on how clever of you to exclude to firewall the the process because in the U.S. the American Dairy Association wields so much power in Congress that I can't clearly see how we are going to revise that milk requirement, even though we have a very large number of children in the schools who are lactose intolerant and for whom either alternatives have to be provided or have you. So I'm, <laughs> congratulations on <laughs> keeping your dairy industry out of the, the process. Um, you know, I think that the health benefits of eating a healthy meal um, have been demonstrated and that's part of the, the scientific foundation we have. And I think we need to keep um, singing that song, but Clearly, it's not a one-size-fits-all prescription. As you say, the Inuit communities rely much more heavily on fish and meats than on the... So I, I think I don't have wisdom to share. We haven't figured it out here. <laughs> um, it, except that it's got to be enough in consultation with localities to take those differences into People really hate other people telling them what to eat anyway. <laughs> Maybe. One thing I'd add, sorry, you go ahead, please go ahead. No, I was thinking, going to say maybe Lacey has some. <laughs> Well, one thing I'd add, you know, we and our work have been really intentional about kind of shifting 
shifting focus from focus on the language of obesity, um, you know, in particular, and really wanting to acknowledge that the root of many of these health issues are they're rooted in poverty, you know, it's rooted in systemic racism, and really acknowledging um, the opportunity for school food to address those more root cause issues. Um, and of course, that, you know, can't happen without that meaningful community integration, identifying what communities really need and acknowledging that opportunity for school food to be, you know, a source of of economic support and a source of economic relief for families. Um, and so I think that that, you know, focusing on health is certainly a, a pathway that resonates with a lot of people, but um, also, you know, we're really cautious around um, um, ensuring that we acknowledge the systemic issues that are contributing to those health factors versus focusing on the, um, you know, individual food choices or behavior, but um, holding those systemic issues um, and how they resonate within and impact to school food systems too. One of, one of the things about a universal approach is that then you can do real educational program, real food education, because everyone is invited to the table. Um, food service providers will no longer have an, a need or an incentive to sell competitive foods, the so-called smart snacks that Marissa mentioned, um, which very much on been on in decline in the U.S. anyway, but you know, I I think it's a holistic approach to integrating school food with the school day, in a way that makes so it's not just the current health but the long term health. Um, and Lacey, was it you who reported or Marissa you that we now have studies showing that the the um, farm to cafeteria exposure pays off later when students are in so food education works. And I would just say from the um, federal perspective, certainly our current um, presidential administration is um, very honed in on addressing equity issues as Lacey um, described so eloquently as well uh, in, our, in our federal assistance programs. And so really taking um, a critical lens to all of our programming, are there inherent barriers to participation um, that we're not keyed in on um, specific to some of the native food issues that you um, referenced earlier, you know, I, we're coming from a place, unfortunately, right now where our programs are looking at how do you integrate that really on an exception basis. And so when you're starting a program from scratch, how do you institutionalize policies that allow for that from the beginning? Um, so we're, we're sort of working the opposite direction to, I think, try to get to the same place. I don't, I don't know that we have a magic solution quite yet. Um, and then just in terms of health equities and so forth, I mean, we're really trying to focus on um, harnessing more community engagement, um, you know, tapping into coalitions with everyone in the school and um, broader community to really support nutrition services. And so that includes um, school uh, nurses, school boards, school administrations, you know, even um, things that people take for granted and assume are part of food service, but are really, um, really beholden to other other policies um, for education. So it speaks to, as an example, the time that students have to eat lunch. In many cases across the country, they have 10 minutes maybe um, to eat a theoretically a complete meal and some of them don't even get through the food line in 10 minutes, um, but those policies aren't regulated through our nutrition programs, but rather um, through state and local government policies. And so really working hand in hand across sectors. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, this has been a such a wonderful learning opportunity and to dive into the complexities of your school food programs. We really are thankful for the time um, that you've shared with us and then all of your insights. So and I want to thank everyone who participated and, and for asking questions. Um, as Debbie mentioned earlier, this is part of a webinar series called School Food Programs Around the World. Um, so a recording will be available shortly on uh, our website and I'll share the link um, for those who want to take a look uh, about the other uh, webinar recordings. So thank, again, thank you again so much um, for today and um, have a good day everyone and take care. Thank you. Bye. So wonderful. Good. Thanks. Maybe thank we could so uh, so stop much. recording and thank you again, oh, everybody.